Now we will begin part A with the first conversation. Number one. I don't think you'll have time to send out invitations to all the new students. Oh, yes, I will. What do we learn about the woman from this conversation? Number two. Nobody told me that Bill was in the hospital. Sorry, I meant to give you a call when I found out, but it slipped my mind. What does the man mean? Number three. I don't know if I'll be able to turn in my economics paper on time. Haven't you heard? The professor gave us a week's extension on it. What does the woman mean? Number four. I'd like to make an appointment with the doctor for tomorrow. Unfortunately, he's completely booked. What does the woman mean? Number five. Joe just went down to the engineering meeting. Where is it? What does the woman want to know? Number six. I have a collect call from Mike Peterson. I'll accept the charges. What does the woman mean? Number seven. I'd really like to go to the concert tonight, but I don't know if I can spare the time. Music always relaxes me. It might be worth it in the long run. What does the man suggest the woman do? Number eight. Those airplanes are certainly loud. Aren't they, though? What does the woman think about the airplanes? Number nine. Helen and I are thinking of renting a house at the beach in June. Are you interested? June? I guess it's cheaper then, but do you really think it'll be warm enough? What does the woman mean? Number ten. I'm getting hungry. I think we should go to dinner soon. Me too. All I had for lunch was a chocolate bar. What does the man mean? Number 11. Your apartment always looks so good, so spotless. Mine's such a mess. I've been at the lab all week. It's my roommate's doing. What does the woman imply? Number 12. I ran out of coins while doing my laundry. That's too bad. What does the woman mean? Number 13. It's a shame you didn't win your tennis match. I might have won if I'd listened to my coach. What does the man imply? Number 14. The Variety Theater finally went out of business. Well, that's no surprise. It was the worst one in town. What does the woman mean?
Number 15. Shall we run around the park or go for a bike ride? It makes no difference to me. They're both good activities. What does the man say about the activities? Number 16. I can't for the life of me get that washing machine downstairs to work. Do you have any suggestions? Try washing just half of a normal load. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 17. I'm thinking about dropping my swimming class. I'm just not catching on. Stick with it. I did, and I learned how to swim, eventually. What can be inferred about the woman? Number 18. Doctor, this cough medicine doesn't seem to be helping. Can you give me a different prescription? Let's give it another day or two and see how you're doing then. What does the doctor imply? Number 19. Would you like to see those pants in another color? They also come in brown and in navy. Actually, the gray is fine, but I'd prefer something in wool. What will the man probably do next? Number 20. Professor Burns seems to think there's only one way to write a paper, and that's her way. No kidding. She sure wasn't like that last semester. What can be inferred about Professor Burns? Go on to the next page. Number 21. This barbecue sure beats the last one we went to, huh? Oh, that's right. Everyone had to spend the whole time inside. Good thing the weather decided to cooperate this time around. What can be inferred from this conversation? Number 22. That new position requires a letter of reference. I guess the one that my professor wrote for me last year should be fine, don't you think? It's a little dated, though. You might want to submit a current one. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 23. I don't think I want to be on the curriculum committee anymore, but I'm not sure how to get out of it. Well, you know, there are plenty of people who'd be interested. Me, for example. What does the man imply? Number 24. Excuse me, could you direct me to customer service? I need to have this gift wrapped. We can take care of that right here, ma'am, at no charge. You can choose either silver or gold with a matching bow. What will the woman probably do next? Number 25. These plants next to the window always look brown. You wouldn't know by looking at them that I water them every week. Maybe they don't like direct sunlight. I had the same problem with some of my plants, and a little shade helped them immensely. What does the woman suggest the man do? Number 26. Oh, no, I just picked up the pictures I took at Dan and Linda's wedding, and look at them. None of them came out. They are dark, aren't they? What a shame. 
Oh, well, I'm sure the professional photographer got everything. What does the man mean? Number 27. I get the feeling that Sally never really listens to me. You said it. It's as if she were always using the time to rehearse what she'll say next. What does the woman imply? Number 28. Will you make sure all the members of the Student Advisory Committee know what to expect at tomorrow's meeting? They'll have a briefing this afternoon. What does the man mean? Number 29. How do you like my new poster? It was only $20. Really? The frame alone is worth the money. What does the man mean? Number 30. I hear Mary isn't getting much support in her run against Steve in the election. It's not over yet. I think she'll make a comeback. What does the woman mean? This is the end of Part A. Go on to the next page. Now read along as the directions for Part B are being read. The test continues on side two. In this part of the test, you will hear longer conversations. After each conversation, you will hear several questions. The conversations and questions will not be repeated. After you hear a question, read the four possible answers in your test book and choose the best answer. Then, on your answer sheet, find the number of the question and fill in the space that corresponds to the letter of the answer you have chosen. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Go on to the next page. we will begin Part B with the first conversation. Questions 31 through 34. Listen to a conversation between two friends. I've been studying too much and need a change, so I just made plans to go away during January break. Really? Where are you going? I'm planning to visit New Mexico. Hey, my sister and I vacationed there last year. We had a great time. Did you get into Albuquerque? Sure, whenever we weren't skiing. Is it far from the mountains? Not at all. See, even though Albuquerque's on a high, flat plateau, there are even higher mountains near it. Just half an hour away from the city, there are snow-covered slopes. Well, if the mountains are only 30 minutes away, I guess I should take my ice skates and my skis. Definitely. I heard that the weather there is great. It is. Low humidity, moderate temperatures, but you do need to be careful of the high altitude. What should I do about that? Oh, just take it easy for a few days. Don't go hiking up the mountains or exercise too vigorously. Just do everything gradually. I'm sure I'll be fine. And I'll let you know all about my trip when I come back. Number 31. What is the main purpose of the man's trip? Number 32. Why does the woman know so much about Albuquerque? Number 33. What can be inferred about the man? Number 34. According to the woman, what may cause the man the most problems in Albuquerque? Questions 35 through 38. 
Listen to two students talk about eating at the school cafeteria. Hey, Linda, did you get that letter about the new options for food service next year? Not yet. Are there a lot of changes? There sure are. Instead of paying one fee to cover all meals for the whole school year, we'll now be able to choose how many meals per week we want and can contract for just that amount. We still have to pay for the whole year at the beginning, but we can choose to buy 7, 10, 14, or 21 meals per week. They give you a card with the number of meals you get per week marked on it. That's a big change, Tom, and a complicated system. Yeah, but it'll be much better for people who don't eat three meals a day, seven days a week in the cafeteria, because they won't have to pay for meals they don't eat. But what's the deal for those who do eat at school all the time? It's better for them, too, because the more meals you contract for, the cheaper each one is. I see. It still sounds rather complicated. True. It took me several hours to figure it out. I decided to go with the 10-meal plan. Why's that? Well, I never eat breakfast, and I often go away on weekends. So the 10-meal plan gives me lunch and dinner every weekday at a fairly low price, and I won't be paying for meals that I don't usually eat. But what about the weekends when you are on campus? Well, there are often guests on campus on weekends, so they allow you to buy single meals on a walk-in basis on Saturdays and Sundays. The price per meal is much higher that way, but I'm away so much that it'll still be less money for me to pay single meal prices on the weekend rather than sign up for the 14-meal-a-week plan. Hmm. I guess I'll have to sit down and figure out my eating pattern so I can get the best deal. Number 35. What is the main feature of the new method of paying for meals? Number 36. When do students pay for the meals they contract for? Number 37. How does the new plan benefit students who eat all of their meals in the cafeteria? Number 38. How can weekend guests eat in the cafeteria? This is the end of Part B. Go on to the next page. The correct choice is D. Remember, you are not allowed to take notes or write in your test book. Go on to the next page. Now we will begin Part C with the first talk. Questions 39 through 42. Listen to this talk being given on a college campus. I was really glad when your club invited me to share my coin collection. It's been my passion since I collected my first Lincoln cent in 1971. That's the current penny with Abraham Lincoln's image. Just a little history before I start in on my own collection. Lincoln pennies are made of copper and they were the first United States coin to bear the likeness of a president. It was back in 1909, when the country was celebrating the centennial of Lincoln's birth in 1809, that the decision was made to redesign the one-cent piece in his honor. Before that, the penny had an American Indian head on it. The new penny was designed by artist Victor David Brenner. This is interesting because he put his initials, VDB, on the reverse of the coin in its original design. There was a general uproar when the initials were discovered, and only a limited number of the coins were struck with the initials on them. Today, a penny with the initials from the San Francisco Mint, called the 1909S VDB, is worth over $500. Now, when I started my coin collection, I began with the penny for several reasons. There were a lot of them, several hundred billion have been minted, and there were a lot of people collecting them, so I had plenty of people to trade with and talk to about my collection. Also, it was a coin I could afford to collect as a young teenager. In the 25 years since then, I have managed to acquire over 300 coins, some of them very rare. 
I'll be sharing with you today some of my rarer specimens, including the 1909S VDB. Number 39. Why does the woman collect coins? Number 40. Why were the letters VDB on some pennies? Number 41. What was one of the reasons the speaker collected pennies as a teenager? Number 42. What will the speaker do next? Questions 43 through 46. Listen to a talk from a biology class. Today I want to talk to you about wasps and their nests. You'll recall that biologists divide species of wasps into two groups, solitary and social. Solitary wasps, as the name implies, do not live together with other wasps. In most species, the male and female get together only to mate, and then the female does all the work of building the nest and providing food for the offspring by herself. Solitary wasps usually make nests in the ground, and they separate the chambers for individual offspring with bits of grass, stone, or mud, whatever is handy. What about social wasps? They form a community and work together to build and maintain the nest. A nest begins in the spring when a fertile female called the queen builds the first few compartments of the nest and lays eggs. The first offspring are small females that cannot lay eggs. These females, called workers, then build a lot of new compartments, and the queen lays more eggs. They also care for the new offspring and defend the nest with their stingers. By the way, only female wasps have stingers. Most social wasps make nests of paper. The females produce the paper by chewing up plant fibers or old wood. They spread the paper in thin layers to make cells in which the queen lays her eggs. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen these nests suspended from trees. They may also be built underground in abandoned rodent burrows. Number 43. Who builds the nests of solitary wasps? Number 44. Why are female wasps more dangerous to people than male wasps are? Number 45. What is the main function of the queen? Number 46. What are the nests of social wasps made of? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to a talk in a class about United States history. One of the most popular myths about the United States in the 19th century was that of the free and simple life of the farmer. It was said that farmers worked hard on their own land to produce whatever their families needed. They might sometimes trade with neighbors, but in general, they could get along just fine by relying on themselves, not on commercial ties with others. This is how Thomas Jefferson idealized the farmer at the beginning of the 19th century. And at that time, this may have been close to the truth, especially on the frontier. But by mid-century, Sweeping changes in agriculture were well underway as farmers began to specialize in the raising of crops such as cotton or corn or wheat. By late in the century, revolutionary advances in farm machinery had vastly increased production of specialized crops, and the extensive network of railroads had linked farmers throughout the country to markets in the east and even overseas. By raising and selling specialized crops, farmers could afford more and finer goods 
and achieve a much higher standard of living, but at a price. Now, farmers were no longer dependent just on the weather and their own efforts. Their lives were increasingly controlled by banks, which had power to grant or deny loans for new machinery, and by the railroads, which set the rates for shipping their crops to market. As businessmen, farmers now had to worry about national economic depressions and the influence of world supply and demand on, for example, the price of wheat in Kansas. And so, by the end of the 19th century, the era of Jefferson's independent farmer had come to a close. Number 47. What is the main topic of the talk? Number 48. According to the professor, what was the major change in agriculture during the 19th century? Number 49. According to the professor, what was one result of the increased use of machinery on farms in the United States? Number 50. According to the professor, why were world markets important for United States agriculture? This is the end of Section 1, Listening Comprehension. Stop work on Section 1. This is a reminder. At the end of the test, the supervisor will collect all of the test books. You may not leave until all of the test...